Welcome to Fantasy Audiobook, Hogwarts, Start Fusion Phoenix Bloodline. Chapter 41. Snape's eyes were blank again at this time, obviously Occlumency was in action again, and he mocked himself indifferently, me. The courtroom has perjured me, I should be locked up in Azkaban now. You sent a dark wizard to teach students to be good. Dumbledore looked at Snape who was a little self-sacrificing at this moment, sighed, got up and patted his shoulder, Severus, I never thought that someone who could use black magic must be a dark wizard. It's to see if he has learned black magic. Can you resist? Look at me, I was rated as a white wizard by the outside world, but it doesn't mean that I don't understand black magic. You can even proudly say that I know them better than those black wizards. Dumbledore took out the pile of cockroaches again, and asked a little unwillingly, you really don't want to try it. Severus, it's made of chocolate, with a little butter added, it's delicious. Snape glanced in disgust at the pile of cockroaches crawling all over the table. Full of resistance, thank you, I don't need it. Alas, what a pity. A lot of people are so confused by its appearance that they forget that it's just a very tasty snack. Dumbledore said regretfully, okay, it's time for me to go. I have to take care of Fox, she has been a little anxious recently, because a very beautiful fellow has come to school, she always wants to make friends, but she is too shy to go, and she has been a little haggard recently. Hearing this, Snape asked in surprise, Dumbledore, you said another phoenix came to the school. Dumbledore nodded with a smile on his face, it's the companion that Peter York brought. From the time he brought the phoenix into the school, Fox sensed it. It's a newborn phoenix, very beautiful. If it weren't for me pretty sure the Dumbledore family isn't missing any blood, I'm going to think Peter's part of our family. Dumbledore watched Snape's eyes grow brighter, and said with a bewitching tone, think about it, if you can gain little Peter's trust, those phoenix tears, fallen feathers, and even phoenix blood, are very easy. Get it, instead of just catching foxes wool like he is now, fox is very resistant to you now and will run if he sees you. The more Snape listened, the more moved his heart became. The tears of the phoenix can heal the dying, which is very precious. And the phoenix feather can not only be used as the heart of a wand, but also as a potion material. As for the blood of the phoenix, just think about it, that is the lifeblood of the phoenix. If you want to covet, phoenix, a magical animal that can fight with dragons and basilisks, will make you feel its power. Immediately he came back to his senses and said calmly, you don't have to worry about it. Peter York is my college student after all, and I will be optimistic about him. Dumbledore smiled contentedly, and then reminded, just give him guidance on the way he chooses, and don't need to get too involved. This kid is very smart and very sharp, and he can't be misunderstood and wary of us. I've wondered more than once, if I hadn't been wary of Voldemort from the start, would his future be different? This time I want to choose again, to choose to believe. I'm sure Peter York won't let me down. Quote. Snape sneered, full of disdain sneering, put away your sympathy, the Dark Lord will not change his mind because of your words. As for this kid Peter, a natural Slytherin, mature and talented you can always turn the situation in your favor. Look at the current Slytherin, in just over a month, except for the few diehards, everyone else chose to accept him. This is not something that an 11-year-old child can do. I can't control his thoughts, you still have to pray that he won't grow crooked, and then you can live for a few more decades. Otherwise, no one can limit him. Quote. Dumbledore laughed. Perhaps I could consider asking Nick for a longevity potion to give myself two more years. Hearing the potion of longevity, Snape's eyes suddenly heated up. As a potion master, especially as a person who is very obsessed with potion research, he has always been eager to study the potion of longevity. But the raw material of this potion is the very precious and unique magic stone. And Nicole May, the only owner of the Philosopher's Stone at present, has been in seclusion, and if it wasn't for a close friend like Dumbledore, he wouldn't be able to contact him at all. He said impatiently, Dumbledore, you can go to Master Nicolem and ask for a potion of longevity. If you give me research, maybe you can develop a potion of longevity that doesn't require a magic stone. Dumbledore shook his head and said with a sigh, Nick contacted me recently and said that he is going to give up using the Philosopher's Stone in the next few years. He has lived for a long time and wants to go on an unknown journey. Snape was very surprised when he heard the news, the Philosopher's Stone can make people immortal. 
Why doesn't he want to continue living? Isn't immortality better? Dumbledore shook his head. Although the Philosopher's Stone can make people immortal, in fact, it only makes people immortal and can't prevent the body from getting old. Nick has lived for more than 600 years, and his body is very fragile, and a single sneeze can break him. This kind of longevity has already tortured Nick. If it wasn't for his love for alchemy that allowed him to persist until now, he might have found a cemetery to bury himself early on. Quote, Peter didn't know the conversation in the potion's office, he was already in the hall at this time. It's noon and the students all gather here for lunch, and lunch in the British wizarding world is very simple, except for a potato or a potato. They can make 180 kinds of potatoes without repetition. Peter sat in his seat, helplessly looking at the food on the table, not having any appetite at all. When he was in York Manor before, he hired a chef from Chinatown to cook Chinese food for him. Even Aunt Christine and housekeeper Welsh, after eating a few Chinese meals, no longer look down on the poor British recipes, they simply eat Chinese food three times a day, and occasionally have a French dish, and eat it every day in a different way. How can I come to Hogwarts, the quality of life has seriously declined. Alan on the side quickly finished his mashed potatoes, then looked at Peter who had simply ate a few bites, and asked, why don't you eat Peter? Is there something wrong with Professor Snape calling you to the office? He scolded you. Already. Peter shook his head. Professor asked me just to talk about school. I'm just going to be crushed by this Hogwarts food. Look at what we eat every day. It's either mashed potatoes. Or hash browns. Either fried potatoes. Or potato bread. Or fish and chips. Oh my god. This is going to get the potatoes to the end. Alan White looked puzzled. I think it's okay, and they're all well done. If you've tried my mother's cooking, you wouldn't say that. Alan's face was full of incomprehensible words, expression. Peter rolled his eyes speechlessly, took out a piece of parchment and a pen from his bag, and began to write something on the paper. Alan looked at the exquisite and gorgeous pen in Peter's hand, and said with some envy, Peter, are you a muggle pen? It looks more useful than a quill pen. You don't have to keep dipping in ink to write, it's too labor-saving. Peter said without looking back, if you like it, I will give you a pen. This pen is an improved product of the muggles on the basis of the quill pen. As long as you absorb enough ink at one time, it can be used for a long time. Time, and I'm still thinking about which professor to find later to help me cast a space-expanding spell on the space where the ink is stored, and fill a few liters of ink at a time. I'm afraid I can use it for a year without dipping in ink. Alan asked in surprise, really? Then I need this kind of pen for my Christmas present. The quill is too troublesome to use, and every time I'm not careful, I get ink everywhere. It's too much. I'm so sick of it. Muggles are smart enough to come up with such an idea. Peter couldn't deny what he said. The wizards in the entire magical world have cognitive biases towards the ordinary world, and they always feel that muggles are stupid and vulnerable. Even muggle-friendly wizards like Weasley inevitably fall into this perception and don't understand normal people at all. Not to mention being a student of Slytherin. After writing the letter, Peter called Field directly. He has been noticed by Dumbledore now, and if he hides it again, it will make people suspect that he has some bad thoughts about hiding. It's better to show off your strength generously. With a pleasant chirping sound, a flame suddenly flashed in the lobby, and the flame turned into a magnificent red gold bird. After circling around the enchanted ceiling, it flew directly in front of Peter. Intimately made a sweet cry. In the surprised and envious eyes of many students, Peter gently stroked the gorgeous feathers of the phoenix, Felder, you are fast, please give this letter to the Welsh butler and come back with what the butler gave you, okay. Field heard Peter's words, nodded affectionately, and then drank the milk that Peter handed over. Alan looked at him enviously, and then picked up his cup reluctantly, eagerly wanting to feed it to Field. Field, you haven't had enough yet, come and drink mine, my cup is goat milk, it's delicious. Field didn't even look at him, and pointed his butt directly at him. Alan muttered in frustration, don't Phoenix like to drink goat milk? Why do you do this to me? Peter looked at this scene amusingly. He and Field had the same mind, but Field regarded Alan as someone who had bad intentions for him. If he hadn't been Peter's friend, he would have slapped Alan in the face. Go early and come back early, Peter said, touching Field's feathers. Field nodded, 
grabbed the envelope directly, and disappeared in place as a flame. The lobby suddenly became lively, and everyone was talking about it. It was the first time that many people saw a magical animal like a phoenix. Although Principal Dumbledore has a phoenix, the ability of the phoenix to teleport makes it always elusive, and it is difficult for ordinary people to see the phoenix. Today, I did not expect that there will be a new student who can have a phoenix. It's so strange. On Slytherin's long table, the classmate closest to Peter asked in disbelief, Peter, you didn't tell us that you actually have a phoenix. Merlin, this is cooler than having a dragon. The entire magical world is probably only Dumbledore. Besides, you are the only one with a phoenix. How did you do it? Peter looked at the curious eyes around him and the ears pricked up on the long table next door, and explained amusingly, this is my phoenix field, when my dad and the others were exploring the Amazon forest in South America, they happened to find a phoenix egg, so I brought it back and gave it to me. And I just hatched it, so it became my partner. When the people around him heard this explanation, they were even more envious. A senior girl said with admiration, There are not many phoenixes in the world, and phoenixes are immortal, so they usually rebirth when they get old and become little phoenixes again. And a phoenix egg, only when two phoenixes meet and combine, can they be conceived with a very low probability. I didn't expect you to be so lucky. Able to touch the phoenix egg. What a blessing to Merlin. Quote, Peter listened to the words of the senior, and he was really grateful to the parents who passed away. If they hadn't left this phoenix egg for him, I'm afraid he could only be a muggle for the rest of his life, and he couldn't activate the gene fusion device. Slytherin's students were even more enthusiastic about Peter. They kept asking questions about Phoenix, which made him a little big, and quickly said, Alan is my roommate, he knew about Phoenix early on, you can ask ask him. Everyone turned their heads and asked Alan with interest. Alan was not impatient, but proudly boasted about his experience with Phoenix, and even said that he was Phoenix Field's favorite person besides Peter. Completely forgot the scene where he was slapped in the face by Field with his butt just now. Before everyone finished eating, Field flashed into the lobby again, grabbed a large gift box and landed on Peter's table. Peter touched Field and praised, it's amazing. I got it back so quickly. Unlike owls flying long distances to transport things, Peter's phoenix is teleported directly to the York Manor, and the delivery process is almost negligible. The time in between is probably spent by the butler whales reading the content of the letter and helping himself prepare things, time. So, if there is a phoenix, it is really convenient. You can go wherever you want, send whatever you want, and there are no restrictions at all. Peter decided that in the next time, he would follow Field to learn this skill, and he could also become a phoenix. It makes no sense that Field would not have the skills he would. As long as he learns it, no matter where he is trapped in the future, he can teleport out directly and ignore the magic ban. It can be said to be a very useful life-saving skill. Although he is now fused with the Phoenix bloodline, there is no need to be afraid of being killed by a Nevada, but no one wants to suffer these curses, he is just immortal, not painless. And according to Peter's understanding of the Phoenix, he feels that if he is hit by the life-threatening curse, although he will not die, there is a high probability that he will be reborn from the ashes like other Phoenixes and then become a new Phoenix. This also means that he has become a child again. In this case, Peter may have to be sent an acceptance letter from Hogwarts again. Peter feels a little horrified just thinking about his endless acceptance letters. Unpacking, there are several beautifully bound cookbooks, namely French cookbooks, Italian cookbooks, and the thickest Chinese cookbook. There is also a letter next to it, written by the butler Wales. Seeing the recipe in the package, Alan asked in surprise, Peter, how did you get the recipe? Are you going to study food magic? Peter smiled and shook his head, in order to stop my stomach from being devastated by potatoes, I decided to give these recipes to the chefs at Hogwarts and let them improve the food at Hogwarts. Is there a chef at Hogwarts? Isn't our food concocted by magic? A second-year Slytherin asked innocently. The girl next to him rolled his eyes at him, have you forgotten Gamp's basic law of transformation? Food can't be conjured out of thin air. The school has always had a kitchen but the staff in it will not show up at will, so they do a good job after the food, it will be teleported into the lobby through magic, so many people think it was conjured out of thin air. There are employees in the back kitchen. What kind of employees? 
Why have we never met them? The second year boy asked curiously. Some students are also very curious. They have never noticed this problem before, nor do they know that there is a back kitchen in the school. Looking at the people who didn't explain, Peter said, the back kitchen is on the first floor, next to the Hufflepuff dormitory, and the staff inside are not humans, but house elves. They are responsible for the kitchen work and maintenance of the entire Hogwarts. Here, even the dirty clothes and socks that we changed at night were washed for us by them. It's just that they basically don't show up in front of people, so many people don't know these things. House elves, I didn't know there were house elves in the school. It's amazing, Slytherin's students are almost pure blood, and of course they know this race for wizards. House elves are only found in old wizarding families, so even pure-blooded Slytherin students have never seen house elves. They are very curious about this race that serves wizards. A first-year girl said proudly, we have a house elf in our family who has been cooking for our family. I just didn't expect Hogwarts to have a house elf. Peter looked at this Miss Flora Shaker. He didn't usually interact with this lady, but he was often in the common room, listening to her constantly showing off her family background to the surrounding classmates, saying that she was a holy 28 pure a member of the Shaker family, one of the blood families, with a somewhat coquettish personality. It's just that she is a little fascinated by Peter. According to the Gossip King Alan quietly revealed that Flora pulled five first-year girls to form a Peter support group, and they have been passing news about Peter to each other. Even what Peter ate and what books he read in the library, he paid attention to them one by one. Peter didn't really believe it at first, but since he often met Flora Shaker in class, during meals, and even in the library. She greeted him shyly. He knew that Ellen didn't lie. At this time, Flora Shaker was proudly announcing that she had a house elf, but her eyes kept glancing at Peter. When she saw Peter looking at her, she immediately turned her eyes away shyly, with an expression of wanting to speak. Ellen also noticed this scene next to Peter, snickered and leaned towards Peter, and said jokingly, or you can promise to be with Flora, see how fascinated she is with you, how can you be willing to reject it? And everyone said that they have house elves, you don't have to do anything in the future, you just need to lie down and enjoy yourself. How about it, don't you mind? Peter directly pushed Alan's head away and said helplessly, you guys are too precocious, you know so much at the age of 11. I don't want to fall in love so early. If you want to be envious, go after yourself. Quote. Alan pretended to be sad and said, if I had your appearance, I would have chased after you. And I have more than one girlfriend. But the problem is that my parents made me look like this, and I can't help it. Besides, this is nothing in the magic world. Many students fall in love early in school. After a few rounds of love, when they reach the fifth, sixth and seventh grade, they choose to live for life and get married as soon as they graduate. My parents are like that, and so are many others. And to say that we are nothing, those pure blood families with hundreds of years of history, such as the Lestrange family, the Black family, these families have been married since childhood and then in school. Just fall in love and get married after graduation. That's completely blinding. Peter listened to Alan's words and was a little dumbfounded. He didn't expect such operations in the magic world. Looking up at Flora, who had a shy face on the opposite side, Peter could only recite a sin in his heart, he is not a wretched uncle. Moreover, his body is only 11 years old now, and the hardware is not fully developed. He is not interested in the love of elementary school students who are pulling little hands. Let's wait until he is an adult. And to be honest, the population base of the wizarding world is too small, and most of them like intermarriage, so it is difficult to find beautiful girls. If you want to fall in love, of course, you need to find a beautiful conversation. Just like his Aunt Christine, although she is a non mariogeist she has never been short of boyfriends, and all of them are handsome. Sometimes Peter is also fantasizing, or he will learn from his aunt in the future. Go to the muggle world and find a bunch of beautiful girlfriends, and change one every once in a while. And Peter is rich and an earl. Although there is no real power, it is still very popular in European and American countries. With a handsome face, there should be many beauties like it. By the time all lunches are over, the food and debris on the table are gone. After Peter asked Phoenix Field to play by himself, he got up and walked out, holding the recipe. Alan chased after him and asked, where are you going, Peter? Peter waited for him for a while, then replied, 
go and deliver recipes to the house elves, and try to eat food from other countries tonight. I'm going too. I've never seen a house elf. Alan chased after him. The kitchen is located directly below the hall, and can be reached along the stairs leading to Hufflepuff's basement. The two of them came to the underground corridor. The corner was brightly lit, and there was a picture of a bowl of fruit hanging on the wall. Under Alan's confused eyes, Peter reached out and scratched the pear in the painting. The pear giggled and turned into a green doorknob, revealing the entrance to the kitchen. Peter smiled and said to the surprised Alan, Remember what I did just now. If you are hungry in the future, you can come here to find something to eat by yourself. The house elves will entertain you very warmly. Asterisk. The two entered the kitchen. Alan looked at the furnishings in the kitchen in surprise. The space here was almost as large as the Hogwarts Great Hall above. It was a large room with a high ceiling, surrounded by stone walls. Lots of gleaming copper pots and basins, and at the other end of the room was a big brick fireplace. In the house, there are also four large tables, placed in exactly the same position as the tables of the four colleges in the auditorium above. Alan said in surprise, except that there is no magic on the ceiling, it is just the other side of the auditorium. Immediately, he saw hundreds of house elves wrapping tea towels with the Hogwarts crest as robes. These elves have large, bat-like ears, protruding green eyes the size of tennis balls, and long, flat noses that are thin and small. A tea towel can be worn as a robe. At this time, they were busy using magic to let the plates jump into the sink to wash themselves, and then fly the leftovers from the students into a black hole in the corner. Kind of cleaning work. An elf saw Peter and Alan, and he asked curiously, Mr. Peter York, there are still unknown wizards. I don't know what you are doing here. Didn't you have a meal in the lobby just now? Do you need it? Do you need Kiki to prepare food for you? Peter shook his head quickly, we've already eaten. I just want to give you a present this time. As soon as the words fell, the busy and noisy kitchen fell into silence, and even the plates flying in the air stopped, and all the elves stared at Peter. Mr. Peter York said he wanted to give us a present. Kiki looked at Peter in disbelief, as if she had heard something she couldn't hear. Peter nodded, then put the cookbooks he was holding on the table, and said a little embarrassedly, it can't be said to be delivered, mainly because I saw Hogwarts, it seems that it has always been cooking British food, it seems too monotonous. So I found a few cookbooks about France, Italy, and China, I hope you can learn them, and then make them for us to taste. He didn't dare to say that the food was not delicious this time, he could only put it mildly, and the rest of the elves would be ashamed to hit the wall again. A wizard gave us recipes. A wizard gave us recipes. The elf looked in disbelief and then her big eyes filled with tears instantly, and then she cried nervously, Woo, no one has given us a present since Helga Hufflepuff left. No one has ever cared about us. Kiki is so happy. Mr. Peter York is such a nice guy. Willing to give a house elf gift. Kiki stepped forward and hugged Peter's leg, crying. Peter couldn't help laughing and laughing. He only sent recipes for his own benefit because he was fed up with British food. He didn't expect these house elves to be so moved, it made him feel a little helpless. The other house elves were hugging each other and weeping so loudly that the whole kitchen was full of cries, and Aaron who was on the side was blinded. Seeing this situation, Peter hurriedly shouted, Don't cry yet. Which elf is the best at cooking? The house elves seemed to have been pressed the pause button, and they stopped crying, and one of the little elves with tears came forward, I'm Lolo, Mr. Peter York, I'm the best at food. Magic. Peter handed the thickest Chinese cookbook from the table to Lolo, and said to the bewildered elf, this is a Chinese cookbook, which records the most representative dishes. In the future, this book will the book will be handed over to you, you have to learn the above food practices, let me try it first. If you encounter any problems, you can come to me. Remember. Lolo was holding the recipe that almost covered most of his body, and his big eyes were full of disbelief. He didn't expect that this task would be entrusted to him. This made him instantly ecstatic. Tears began to fill up in his eyes again. Holding the heavy book, he kept bowing to Peter, Thank you, Mr. Peter York. Thank you, Mr. Peter York. I will take good care of it and make delicious Chinese dishes for you. Then Peter looked at the other elves with envious eyes, and handed the remaining two recipe books to the first two. These three recipe books are just the ones I gave to you temporarily, you should follow the contents of the books carefully. 
Make delicious food, and I will send you recipes in the future. There are many more recipes like this. Farewelled by many house elves, the two left the kitchen. When the kitchen door closed, both of them breathed a sigh of relief, these little elves were so enthusiastic. Especially when looking at you with those big eyes wet, ordinary people can't resist. Alan asked curiously, Peter, why are there so many house elves in Hogwarts? I probably looked at them, and there are hundreds of them. Why have I never heard of them? Looking at the kitchen entrance, which had been restored to a portrait, Peter explained, it's all thanks to Helga Hufflepuff, who took in a lot of homeless house elves, put them in the kitchen, and promised them to work for the school, will be forever protected at Hogwarts. That's why these house elves have been living in Hogwarts for thousands of years, and they have abide by the agreement with Helga Hufflepuff and silently maintain everything in the school, so that this castle that has stood for thousands of years is still as bright as new. Asterisk. After a noon fermentation, the morning potions class accident quickly spread among the four academies. Especially seeing Peter carrying two blood-covered students into the infirmary, rumored to have noses and eyes. Even later, there were rumors that the two had been poisoned by Snape. Snape's horror was rendered more terrifying than the Dark Lord among the four academies, and some of the timid Hufflepuff girls were already crying and going home because their potions class was in the afternoon. The twins, who didn't think they were old enough, sat on the long table, vividly describing what happened in the potions class. You don't know, when the old bat looked at us, the evil smile could no longer be hidden. He came directly to us. George said exaggeratedly, acting like a fear. Let's drink the potion in the cauldron and see if we'll be all right. Fred took George's words, he hid his hands in his robes, but I swear I saw a green bottle of magic in his hand. Medicine, let out a deadly light. George took over the words again. He approached us with a dangerous expression, and wanted to add his potion hidden in his sleeve to our cauldron while we were helpless. With sad and angry expressions, the two said in unison, he wants to poison us. So Hogwarts loses all the source of happiness. Immediately, the two of them said triumphantly, but how could our Weasley duo be willing to surrender to fate? We immediately drank the potion we made before he implemented his dangerous plan. Let his the evil plan finally goes bankrupt. Although the smell is indeed a bit pungent, it definitely has no side effects. The two recalled the smell of the potion and said in a word. Afterwards, the two stood directly on the bench, took out dozens of droppers, and said to the classmates of Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff opposite, walking by, don't miss it. You must have another potions class this afternoon. Drink your own potion like we did in the morning. In order to avoid being poisoned, you can buy a sobriety potion from us. There's a drop of potion hidden in a dropper. When Snape wants you to try the potion, you can stealthily swap the dropper. When the time comes to take our potion, you can escape this crisis with nothing. Only two copper nuts are needed for a dropper. Affordable and safe. Quote. A Ravenclaw student said disdainfully, we want to buy and also buy high quality potions like those made by Peter York. Why buy potions with a lot of impurities like yours? The twins were not angry but said with a smile, then do you think you can make such a good potion? The boy from Ravenclaw said puzzledly, what does this have to do with the poor quality potions you sell? The twins said with a look that you don't understand, you all know that your potion level is not as good as Peter York. When the professor randomly checks and sees that the potion in your dropper is different from the potion in the cauldron, this is not the case. Is it you? And our potion is in line with the potion level of the vast majority of classmates. Even if it is a random check, who can prove that the potion is not drawn from the cauldron? Quote. After being fooled by the twins for a while, quite a few students actually bought spare potion droppers from them. Watching the twins happily count the copper nut they just earned, Peter sitting at the Slytherin table was stunned, the twins are so showy. The afternoon was Mrs. Hooch's flying lesson, so everyone was looking forward to it. Flying lessons are held once a week and first graders are not allowed to bring flying brooms to school, so for these students, flying lessons are a rare opportunity. Good afternoon, classmates. Mrs. Hooch was wearing a capable flight uniform, with eagle eyes and short white hair, like a bald eagle. Good afternoon, Mrs. Hooch. Slytherin and Gryffindor students greeted each other. Classmates, we have learned the flying skills of broomsticks last week, and we will do our own activities today but the flying space is not allowed to exceed the Quidditch pitch. 
Otherwise, I will let him know the consequences of disobedience. Do you hear? Mrs. Hooch said solemnly. As soon as it heard that it was a free event, everyone cheered and shouted happily, Okay, Mrs. Hooch. Everyone carried the school's very worn broomsticks and rushed into the sky, feeling this rare flight time. Peter also sat on his broom and flew into the sky unhurriedly, and came to a position as high as Ravenclaw's tower, admiring the scenery below. Peter's flying talent may be due to the addition of the Phoenix bloodline, and he is very comfortable in the sky. Slytherin's Quidditch captain, Warrington, wanted to invite Peter to join the team a few times as a seeker. But they were all rejected by Peter. He likes flying, but he doesn't like being tied to Quidditch. It's fine for him to be a spectator, but he doesn't want to spend a lot of time practicing with the team every day. Two years before Voldemort's official debut, and six years before Voldemort's official resurrection. Although it looks like a long time, with his current strength, it's okay to attack students in the school, but if you want to face Voldemort, I'm afraid even his subordinates can't deal with it. It's not that he has to fight against Voldemort, but he is a muggle-born Slytherin student. If he doesn't want to crawl in Voldemort and call his master, he must stand opposite Voldemort. Not to mention that he is now the best among the first-year students. As for pretending to be a pig and eating a tiger, he can only think about it. If he dares to pretend to be a pig in Slytherin, these snobbish Slytherin students will dare to keep coming. He is troublesome, troubled to death. Asterisk. Just as he was thinking, a figure in the distance rushed towards him. Peter reacted in a timely manner to avoid the frontal impact of the person who came, and then found that it was one of the twins, swaying from side to side with a smile. He said angrily, Fred, you almost knocked me down. If you attack me like this again, I will fight back. Fred said with a hippie smile, Wrong, I'm George. And who told you to be in a daze in midair, looking thoughtful and worried, those who didn't know thought you were thinking about the future of the magic world. And you are sure you can can you get me on the counter? I'm a Gryffindor batter. Peter rolled his eyes and said, Reservists. And Fred, don't use your brother's name again, your trick doesn't work in front of me. I can tell who you are. Fred didn't believe it, how is it possible, even my mother can't tell the difference between us. Immediately, George from a distance also flew over, what are you talking about? Peter says he can tell who we are. I don't believe it. Fred said directly. When George heard it, he didn't believe it either, so he put his hands up and said, how do you tell us to distinguish us? Peter pointed out directly. Compared to Fred, George, you are relatively stable and less talkative. Instead, you are more like a brother. And although you look exactly the same, even the freckles on your faces are the same, but Fred's voice is thinner, and George is a little lower. People with average hearing may not be able to tell the difference, but my ears are very sensitive. When George heard Peter's explanation, he was a little surprised, and then proudly said to Fred, Look, Fred, even Peter thinks I look more like a brother. I always thought that my mother might not be able to tell who we are. Who? So we got our birth order wrong. I should be my brother. Fred retorted in dissatisfaction. Fart, I was born first, so I'm my brother. The two ignored Peter directly, quarreled in the air, and rammed each other with their bodies on their brooms, arguing about who was the brother. Looking at the two playful twin brothers, Peter couldn't help but think of the final sad ending of the two in another world without his participation, and couldn't help but sigh. He liked the twin brothers very much in the previous life, but in the end, Fred had one ear cut off, and George never woke up again in the decisive battle. Since then, the magic world has lost a pair of twins who can bring laughter. The twins Fred and George are undoubtedly the funniest brothers in the wizarding world in Peter's opinion, and they bring laughter anywhere, anytime. As long as they appear, it will immediately make people feel relaxed and happy. As a student of Slytherin, it would be unwise to befriend someone from Gryffindor, an old foe. But Peter is willing to make good friends with these two people, because as long as they exist, he will unconsciously relax and be happy. This is even more pleasing from the bottom of my heart than Phoenix's singing. Especially as a person who knows the main line of the future, Peter has always been a very rational person. Since he came to the magic world, he no longer believes that the future will continue like the original line. Although he is now immortal, there are ways to make life worse than death. Especially the Crucitus curse, which can torture the Longbottom couple, who are senior orers, crazy.
Peter didn't think he could survive the Crucitus torture if he was caught. That's why he studied so hard and wanted to have the ability to protect himself and his friends as soon as possible before Voldemort rose again. Like the twins in front of him, he didn't want them to fall into their original fate again. Fred and George were one, and they were always inseparable. Adventure together, play Quidditch together, invent Weasley magic tricks together, play tricks together, laugh at Percy together. It can be said that two people are the most wonderful partners, no one can do without each other, both sides are the most important half of each other. Both have wands from the same tree, wand hearts from the same unicorn. Even the form of the patron saint is a magpie. But after losing Fred, George was never able to conjure a Patronus again, because all his happy memories were related to Fred. Even every mirror George sees is the mirror of a rise. But he must have clearly realized that the person in the mirror is missing an ear. As Peter's two favorite characters, he hopes his presence will change their future. He hopes that in the future, he can see a pair of cheerful twin brothers in Diagon Alley and bring happiness to everyone. Peter clicked on his system panel at this time, and it showed that his points had reached 75 points. Only 25 points left to redeem the bloodline of fusion magical beasts again. According to Peter's approximate estimate, around Christmas, as long as she finishes reading some of the books in the library and successfully performs some new magic, she should be able to collect points. After this period of understanding, Peter's points system, the main source of points is that if you get a teacher's bonus in class, you can get one point, or if you successfully cast new magic, you can get one point, and advanced magic can get one point. If it is two points. The last is the library reading, he originally thought there was no reward. But he didn't expect that after reading ten books carefully, he was awarded one point. If you can memorize ten books, you will be awarded two points. And if you thoroughly master the knowledge in a book, you will be rewarded one point. As for the check-in reward, it can only be regarded as a bonus, one point at Diagon Alley, one point at the train station, and finally one point at Hogwarts. This system is like the Grand Terrace of the Landlord's House, and he can't give up a single cent. Fortunately, the library has accumulated thousands of books, and I am afraid that Peter will not be able to read all the books in the seven years of school. But this is also the origin of his system points. Asterisk. Peter, don't be in a daze. The twins who were still playing shouted at Peter, let's fly faster than who else. Looking at the two eager to try, Peter asked curiously, how to fly? Mrs. Hooch said that you can only fly within the Quidditch pitch. Oh dear Peter, Fred said, Peter who loves listening to the teacher. George said, why are you as boring as Percy? They both said in unison. Then he flew to Peter's side, rubbed his eyebrows and winked, of course we have to listen to the teacher, so we are going to fly around the Quidditch pitch, using this as the starting point to see who can reach the Forbidden Forest first, on the grass. The winner can make a claim to the loser. How, do you want to play? Peter looked at these two guys, no matter how he looked at it, he didn't think things would be so simple, and looked at them suspiciously, could it be that you guys are trying to make some crazy idea to make me lose, and ask me? How is this possible? How can you think of us like that? The twins complained, looking heartbroken, we want to play a game to pass the time, Peter, you hurt our hearts so much. Peter looked suspiciously at the exaggerated expressions of the two brothers, really. Of course it's true, the twins vowed, if it's false, our dearest brother Percy will not be able to find a girlfriend for the rest of his life. Peter rolled his eyes when he heard it, he was really a brother and brother. Peter didn't bother to pay attention to what the hell they had in mind, and it just so happened that he was also a little bored, and by the way, he used the exciting flying competition to dispel the stagnation in his chest. He is only 11 years old now, what is he thinking so much about? So he smiled and said, let's compare, but the demands that the winners make from the losers can't be too much. The twins looked at each other with a smile of purpose in their eyes, and happily assured, don't worry, we won't ask you to embarrass you, you can refuse if you don't want to. Peter looked at the confident two people speechlessly, isn't that confident yet? Be careful that you lose face in the end. Several people rode on flying brooms, lined up, and with George shouted, start, several people quickly rushed forward. The flying brooms in the school are very old, almost all the sweeping series of brooms produced decades ago. Now the sweep series has been updated to sweep number 15. 
but Peter noticed that he himself rode this broom, which was marked Sweep 5. You can see how old the broom is. The three flying competitions go hand in hand, Peter's flying talent is like an instinct, and the Weasley twins have been exposed to broomsticks since childhood, and all three are flying at the maximum speed of the broom. There were other students flying in the sky, and they soon noticed the competition of the three, exclaimed, and then began to cheer loudly. Come on, Weasley, over Slytherin, shouted one of the Gryffindor boys. In an instant, Slytherin glared at him. Come on, Peter, leave those two Gryffindors behind, you can do it. The Slytherin student shouted loudly, not to be outdone. Especially Flora Shacklebolt, pulling her roommate along and screaming cheers. The people of Slytherin and Gryffindor flew into the air one after another and split into two teams to cheer for the people from their respective academies. Peter and the twins heard the movement, and even increased their speed, trying to reach the finish line first. Although they were playing at the beginning, they don't want to admit defeat now. Peter rode on the broom, leaned forward and rushed forward. The broom had been added to the maximum value by him. Because of the speed, this old flying broom began to make an overwhelmed sound. Peter and the others did not fly in a straight line, because Mrs. Hooch took them to the Quidditch pitch this time to practice. So surrounded by high audience stands, there are railings and obstacles around, Peter and the twins have to make sure they don't hit them during the flight. And to ensure speed. So it looks very exciting. With the flying talent and agile body endowed by the phoenix, Peter quickly came out on top. But the twins weren't vegetarian either, and they kept close behind Peter, not being left behind in the ups and downs of the flight. Such a thrilling flying competition aroused cheers from the students of the two schools present. The school Quidditch competition has not yet officially started, so these students are only known by their names. Usually, the flying lessons are just practiced slowly according to the professor's instructions. It was so exciting at the moment, and they all got excited and cheered for both sides. Mrs. Hooch was also attracted by the movement of the students, and saw that three students were flying around the buildings in the Quidditch at a very fast speed. It seems that it is about to crash into the stands at any time, which is very thrilling. Seeing this scene, Mrs. Hooch was trembling with anger. These restless students can always make trouble when she is not paying attention. In the end, after the three circled around the field, when they were about to reach the end, the Weasley twins, who were a broom distance behind, still wanted to cheat and reached out to grab Peter's broom. As a result, Peter seemed to have eyes behind his back, and he took a snake-like position to get rid of the entanglement of the two. And the twins almost fell off the broom because of their inertia. In the end, Peter was the first to reach the finish line with a broom ahead, which made the Slytherin students cheer with joy. Peter stopped the broom, looked at the dejected twins with a funny look, and said, how about it? Just admit defeat, you still want to hold me down, I already guessed your thoughts. Remember that you owe me a request. Quote. York and Weasley, what the hell are you doing? Mrs. Hooch angrily flew in front of them on her broomstick and demanded, you almost broke your neck. Before Peter could speak, the twins said innocently to Mrs. Hooch, ma'am, we did follow your request and did not leave the Quidditch range. Asterisk. In the end, the twins were confiscated by an angry Mrs. Hooch and driven off the Quidditch pitch. Peter followed the giggling twins speechlessly at this time, complaining, it's all your fault, now even I'm implicated by you and kicked out by Mrs. Hooch. If there are not many flying lessons at the end of the semester, I will then the two of you will pay off the debt. George and Fred stopped, turned left and right to Peter's side, put them on Peter's shoulders, and said with a relaxed expression, we've already learned from Charlie, the flying class exam is very simple, almost very easy. Few people haven't passed the exam. Not to mention geniuses like us, it's just a matter of sprinkling water. Don't worry. Immediately, the two of them rolled their eyes and asked with a smile, let's go, we have discovered a magical place that will suddenly appear and disappear. It's just that you can't open it. Peter, you have a lot of magic and a smart brain. Come and help us, is there any other way to find it? Peter listened to the words of the two and had some guesses in his heart, so he followed them. The three walked up the moving stairs until they came to the eighth floor, where the twins pulled Peter to a stone wall, where there were no portraits like other places, only the opposite was painted with a troll stick. Silly the tapestry of Barnabas. George explained. We were blocked by Filch during our last night tour and had nowhere to hide. When we were about to be caught, 
a wooden door appeared on the wall and we quickly hid in, escaped Filch's pursuit. Fred said in surprise. The wooden door that suddenly appeared was a broom cabinet, but when we came out, the wooden door disappeared. No matter how we looked, we couldn't find it. We suspect that the tapestry on the opposite side is here. There is a switch in a secret room, but after looking for a long time, I only know that the tapestry is about stupid Barnabas who thinks he can teach the troll to dance ballet, but he is beaten by the troll with a big stick. There is no other information at all. Peter didn't expect the twins to come into contact with the House of Requirements so early. If he didn't show up, they should have given up their search after the inquiries were fruitless. They were used to practice magic as a DA club when Harry Potter was in fifth grade. The place. Peter knew there was a Voldemort's Horcrux hidden there, and he had wanted to give it to Dumbledore before, but he felt the time was premature, and he didn't know how to explain how he knew it. This Horcrux is hidden here. On the eighth floor is the principal's office and Gryffindor's dormitory. As Slytherin students live in cellars and usually don't show up here. So when Peter practiced magic, he would rather go to the screaming room under the beater willow to practice than to come to the room of responsiveness. Peter listened to the twins' description, pretended to be surprised, then carefully observed the surrounding details, and then said, I may know the mysterious room you are talking about. I seem to be on a book in the library saw the description of this secret room. The twins' eyes lit up when they heard it, and they couldn't wait to look at Peter. Fred urged, Peter, tell me what the book says. Did you tell me how to make the house appear? Peter pretended to think, and then said, the book calls this secret room the room of responsiveness, saying that the house can be transformed into different rooms according to people's wishes. It's amazing. Peter ignored the urging of the two, went directly under the tapestry, walked back and forth along the wall three times, and wanted a room to practice magic. The twins looked at Peter's strange behavior, and then saw a wooden door suddenly appear on the originally bare wall. Seeing the wooden door appear, Peter turned around and said to the two of them with a smile, the way to get in is to walk under the tapestry and in front of the wall three times, thinking about the room you want, and the house will appear. Then he opened the wooden door and greeted the two of them, go in and see what the room I want is like. The twins looked at the scene in surprise and shouted in unison, cool. This is amazing. Then the three walked into the room. The room was very spacious, almost as big as the auditorium. There are also some protective gear, as well as a few puppets that look like they are used for practicing magic, and a few ring targets. Wow, the twins were surprised, George said, the broom closet we hid in before was very narrow, but I didn't expect it to come out into such a wide room. How did it come about? Fred looked at the furnishings around him and asked in surprise, Peter, what you wished for in the room of requirement just now was a room for practicing magic. Peter nodded, the room of requirement can fulfill many wishes, and what I wanted was a place where I could practice magic, so it helped me make it happen. Can any wish come true? The twins' eyes lit up. If we wish we had a room full of galleons, do you think it will come true? Asterisk. Peter was speechless and gave them a blank look, you can try it and see if it can help you achieve it. Unexpectedly, these two people who saw the money really wanted to try it, so they drove Peter directly out of the room of requirement and waited until the wooden door on the wall slowly disappeared. The twins came under the tapestry with anticipation, and walked back and forth in front of the wall three times with words in their mouths. Then a bronze door that resembles the gate of the Gringotts vault appeared. Yeah, it really appeared. The twins gave each other high fives happily. Although Peter was a little surprised by this, he still poured cold water and said, maybe it is empty and there is nothing inside. The twins were not shocked by Peter's words, but came to the bronze door with great interest, opened the door and walked in first. Then came the surprised voices of the two. Peter walked in curiously when he heard it, but was shocked by the sight in front of him. I saw that in this vault room, there was a pile of golden galleons like a hill. At this time, the Weasley brothers were dancing happily, stuffing a lot of gold coins into their pockets. They had never seen so many gin galleons before, and they were almost overjoyed at this time. As soon as the brothers saw Peter, they hurriedly greeted, Peter, hurry up and get the golden galleons. With so many golden galleons, you can buy Diagon Alley. Peter was also stunned by these gold galleons at first, there are at least millions of gold galleons here. But then Peter felt something was wrong. He leaned over and picked up a gold galleon. After checking it carefully, 
he didn't feel the magic of the fairies from the gold galleon. These are all fake, made with magic. Peter admires the person who created this room for responsiveness. He was able to create such a magical room, and even Kim Galleon made it. If Peter hadn't been different from ordinary people, he would have been deceived. He looked at the two brothers who were still stuffing gold coins on their bodies. Although he couldn't bear to break their sweet dreams, he calmly shouted to the twins, Fred, George. Stop pretending, these are all fakes. It was made by magic. The Weasley brothers stopped when they heard Peter's words, but still shook their heads in disbelief, and said, How is it possible, Peter, you see these gold coins are no different from Gringotts. Maybe this gold coin was a thousand years ago. The property left by the big four. Peter looked at the two brothers with some sympathy. The Weasley family has many brothers, but the whole family relies on the Ministry of Magic, the Muggle Artifact Abuse Bureau, Arthur Weasley who works, and the meager salary to live, life is very difficult. Wearing old robes handed down from the family, buying secondhand books, and even such an important thing as a wand, when it was Ronald's turn, he could only use the old wand that Charlie had eliminated that had exposed unicorn hair. No wonder the twins were so ecstatic when they saw so many gold coins. He said directly to the calmer George, you can walk out of this house with these gold coins and see what changes. As soon as George heard it, he already believed Peter's words. He was full of gold coins. He stepped out of the door of the requirement room and walked a little further amidst the jingling of gold coins. The gold coins on his body suddenly seemed to have been casted on a disappearance spell and disappeared in an instant. George returned to the request room full of disappointment. Seeing his brother was still moving gold coins, he shouted to him helplessly, Fred, don't move anymore. What Peter said is true, these gold coins are fake. Yes, this house was transformed at our request, but as soon as we leave this house, it disappears. When Fred heard this, he threw the gold coins in his hand to the ground in frustration, looked at these golden galleons unwillingly, and murmured, I thought it was time to turn around, but it turned out to be fake. Peter looked at the two lost brothers and felt the same way. He had also experienced this kind of plight of being oppressed by money in his previous life, and he dreamed of suddenly becoming rich. Until he was reborn again and became an aristocrat worth hundreds of millions of pounds in England, the experiences of those previous lives were like a dream, but they were still vivid in his mind. Peter didn't know how to comfort them. The two brothers were always happy. He had never seen such silent and lost twins. It was a penny to beat a hero. He took out two ZZ Honey candies from his pocket, ready to comfort the two brothers, when an idea flashed in his mind. So there was a smile on his face, and he said jokingly, What's the matter, without Gin Galleon, I'm so depressed. I never knew Fred George, you guys love money so much. Come and taste Honey Duke's ZZ Honey candy, when I'm in a bad mood, I like to eat one. The twins took the candy, peeled off the candy wrapper, stuffed the candy into their mouths, and regained their composure. Fred looked at the golden mountain in front of him, determined to say, I will earn so many gold galleons in the future, and then pile it into a golden mountain like now, and count it every day. George took his brother's shoulder and said dissatisfiedly, Oh, brother, don't forget me. Fred looked at George with a full smile, put his hand on George's shoulder, and said, Of course I can't forget you. Let's make money together and fill the Gringotts vault with gold galleons. Then look at those greedy goblins bow down to us. Peter looked at the two brothers who were recovering quickly, and laughed happily, then clapped his hands, attracting the attention of the two of them. You already know the secrets here, and you can come over at any time in the future. Let's leave here first, I know a secret passage, you should be happy when you hear it. Chapter 51 Leaving the Room of Requirement, Peter looked at the door that was slowly disappearing. He knew that somewhere across the wall, there was Voldemort's Horcrux, the Ravenclaw crown that was said to increase wisdom. He wasn't ready to find the Horcrux for the time being, he wasn't sure if he could resist the seductive magic on the Horcrux, so he decided to find a suitable opportunity to tell Dumbledore about the Horcrux. As for the idea of dealing with Horcruxes by himself, it didn't appear in Peter's mind. He was a Slytherin and would never put himself in a dangerous situation. And this Horcrux is not easy to find. First of all, you need to choose the place where you need to hide things from among the many options. Even if you enter this house, you want to find a certain dilapidated crown from a space the size of a football field. It's not easy either. 
There is no hidden danger that someone just finds the crown after entering. So this crown, let it continue to stay in the room of responsiveness. George looked at the wall, touched it in disbelief, and couldn't help but sigh, it's incredible, I don't know which genius invented this house. Fred was also very surprised. He vowed, I'm sure not many people know about this room. Otherwise, it would have been spread all over the place. Peter shook his head and said, I think Dumbledore must know that it's not far from the headmaster's office, and he's been in this school for hundreds of years, and there's no reason he couldn't find it. The twins nodded. Yes, Dumbledore is the greatest great wizard. Of course he knows. Peter wasn't at all surprised by the adoration of Dumbledore by Gryffindor's students. He continued, As for who built this house, I think it's probably Ms. Ravenclaw. It is recorded in the history of the school that she built those moving stairs. It is still in operation after more than a thousand years. Ms. Ravenclaw is not only powerful, but also a very famous alchemist at that time. Her most famous work is the crown that can increase wisdom. There are still many people in Ravenclaw who have not given up their search for it. And Salazar Slytherin was known for black magic and potions, and left the school shortly after it was founded. Godric Gryffindor left Hogwarts shortly after Slytherin left. As for Helga Hufflepuff, it's known for food magic and herbalism. So it's unlikely that they built this room of request. George stared at Peter dumbfounded, and eloquently told these, the secret history he had never heard before, and asked, Peter, where did you know so much, didn't you come from the muggle world? I how do you feel that you are more familiar with the magic world than I am? Fred also looked eager. If I can find Ravenclaw's crown, will I be able to increase my wisdom and figure out a way to make money? Peter looked at the two of them in surprise, have you never read books? There are nearly a thousand years of books in the library. As long as you read more, analyze and analyze, you can get these things. As for the claim that the crown can increase wisdom, I don't really believe it. I think the crown of Ms. Ravenclaw can only make people more focused and more rational, so as to reduce interference from the outside world and make people able to focus on one thing with all your heart to improve efficiency. Peter looked at the wall, as if looking through the wall, but this ability is also very powerful. This is a good helper for learning. If I can have this crown, maybe in the seven years of school, I will maybe I can even finish all the books in the library. As he said that, Peter cursed Voldemort in his heart for turning such an alchemy item into a horcrux. What a waste. He wondered if in the future he would be able to get out and destroy Voldemort's soul without damaging the crown. When the twins heard that he wanted to finish reading all the books, their eyes widened and they held out their thumbs tremblingly, you are amazing. The students in Ravenclaw are not as fond of learning as you are. I think the sorting hat must have made a mistake. You should go to Ravenclaw. Peter smiled and waved his hands, the sorting hat was hesitating between Slytherin and Gryffindor at the beginning, and he finally sorted me into Slytherin. So this kind of thing is not necessarily, maybe your academy will have students who like to study very much in the future. Woolen cloth. The twins looked like you were joking, how is it possible, if there is someone in Gryffindor who loves learning so much, then the sun must have come out of the west. As long as our academy cannot be deducted credits, it will be good. The other time is to play or spend the night. You, where is the time to read books? Peter looked at the expressions of the two of them, covered his stomach and laughed, saying, you guys know a lot about your academy, but are you sure you're not talking about yourself? Professor McGonagall and Principal Dumbledore are both from your academy. I heard that when they went to school, they were all academic masters. So how about your academy? When the two brothers heard it, they suddenly said, yeah, Bill got 12 honors when he graduated last year. At that time, he made my mother so happy, and called Bill baby all day long. It made us disgusted. So they are just a special case. It's like a box of BB multi-flavored beans. Occasionally, a good taste is found, which does not mean that all multi-flavored beans can be eaten. George said with a look of certainty. That's right, so we have to exclude them. We are the most representative students of Gryffindor. We must not let some of their good students represent the entire Gryffindor, this is an insult to us poor students. Fred responded funny. And rode. Peter covered his mouth with laughter and couldn't stand up straight, the twins were so funny. Peter took the Weasley twins and walked down the stairs, just looking at the stairs that swayed from side to side, Peter's road-crazy attributes broke out again. 
It's just that Peter isn't worried anymore since he got Professor Flitwick's spell notes. He took out his wand and said, show me the way. In an instant, a beam of light shot out from the top of the wand, turning into a beam of light, pointing in the direction Peter wanted to go. The twins looked at Peter's movements and asked curiously, what kind of magic do you have, Peter? Peter led the two of them towards the direction of the beam with satisfaction, and said, obviously, this is a guiding spell. It can guide us on the way, and you all know that I often get lost, which I specially learned from Professor Flitwick. Learn with this magic, you don't have to worry about getting lost. Fred touched the beam curiously, and said with interest, Peter, teach us this spell, so that I can escape Filch's pursuit as soon as possible when I travel at night. George nodded in agreement. That old Filch, always staring at us, and his nasty cat, nearly caught us a few times. When we were punished by labor, this old guy let us wash the chamber pot all night. Peter was speechless, the Weasley twins were completely on Filch. He was a little hesitant, should he tell these two people about the secret passage to Hogsmeade? You must know that Joko's magic joke shop is there. There are a lot of trick items there. If the twins find out, I'm afraid they won't mind spending some money on Filch. But thinking that even if they don't tell them, with their ability, I am afraid that they will soon be able to find the secret way to Hogsmeade. You must know that there is more than one secret way to Hogsmeade. As Peter walked, he said to the two behind him, it's not easy for you to learn this spell. Professor Flitwick said that this can only be learned in sixth grade. When I went to ask for advice, he was reluctant to teach me at first. He was only willing to teach me the spells in the first grade textbooks after he had cast all the spells. If you want to learn, be prepared to fail. When George and Fred heard Peter's words, they looked at each other. George asked in disbelief, Peter, did you really finish all the magic knowledge in the first grade textbook? Peter didn't see the expressions of the two of them, and said as a matter of course, of course, there are not many spells to be learned in the first grade, and they are all very simple. You can learn them after a few tries. But like what I used in the potions class, the voice changing spell and this guide spell are relatively more difficult, and it took me a while to master it. Simple, Fred moaned, the corners of his mouth twitched, and then said angrily, I haven't even learned the floating charm that I taught last week. You said it's simple, Merlin's stinky socks, there are does it hit people like that? Seriously, George said, looking at Peter who turned to look at them, you must never talk like that in front of other people in the future, or you will be beaten. Peter looked puzzled, is it really that difficult? I have mastered the floating spell before school started, and now I can cast it even if I don't need to chant it. I always think it's the foundation of the basics. I can't cast it, I can only say that I didn't listen carefully. Fredra took George's hand and said angrily, George, let me go. I'm going to fight him. Is there anyone who talks like this, why don't we listen carefully? What you need to learn. Is there such a thing as saying that, it's so annoying. George looked helplessly at his brother playing tricks, and said directly, brother, even in a duel, you are likely to be knocked down by him at once. The devil knows how many spells he has mastered. The brothers are silent, they know that a person as talented as Peter has a limitless future. Fortunately, both brothers are open-minded and optimistic people. After accepting the gap, they quickly accepted the truth. And Peter was their friend, and they weren't jealous at all. Soon the three of them came to a corner on the third floor, where there stood a statue of a one-eyed witch with a hunchback. Peter tapped the statue with his wand and said, separate left and right, under the surprise of the two. Immediately, the witch's hunchback parted, revealing a stone slide. The Weasley brothers looked at the passage in surprise, Peter, I didn't expect you to find a secret passage. Where does this secret passage lead? Peter explained with a smile, the secret passage leads to Hogsmeade and leads to Honeyduke's cellar. And this is not what I found, but the owner of Honeyduke, Mr. Frome, told me that if I wanted to in the future, he told me. If you want to buy candy, you can go directly to this aisle, and you can bring snacks for other students. Year 1 and 2 students can't go to Hogsmeade yet. I think there will be many people willing to pay a little errand fee to be able to eat Hogsmeade snacks. Quote. When the Weasley brothers heard the last sentence, their eyes lit up. They finally knew why Peter brought them here. Weasley's family is in a difficult situation, even the textbooks for school are secondhand, and it is said that they have pocket money, so the twins will find a way to make money. 
although they knew that Peter had money, they would never accept alms. That's why Peter wanted them to master this secret passage, so that they could go through this secret passage and buy things for the students in the school. At that time, they would be able to charge a little errand fee. A copper nut will break the flower. The twins showed a grateful look to Peter, and felt that this friend was too valuable, and they even thought about how to make money for them. Peter pushed the two of them and said, let's go, let's go in now, and take advantage of this moment to go to Hogsmeade and have a good time. As he said that, he first slid down the stone slide, came to the underground secret passage, and chanted the magic spell, fluorescent flashing, and the wand immediately emitted a bright light, illuminating the dark secret passage. The twins slid down close behind. Cool, I didn't expect there would be a secret passage here. It's great. The twins looked around excitedly, this secret passage will be our purchase channel in the future. Peter reminded them, it's pitch black in this secret passage, and you'd better learn the glow spell first, unless you're willing to carry the bulky kerosene lamps. George took out his wand and said, fluorescent flash, and his wand lit up too, but quickly went out. A little embarrassed, he said, that's the case. Bright can be bright, but it won't last long. Fred also chanted the spell, his glowing spell that lasted a little longer than George's, but quickly died out. Seeing this situation, Peter had to say, you need to focus, don't just relax after the mantra, but keep thinking about making it shine. Try again. Hearing this, George waved his wand and said, fluorescent flashing, and then, as Peter said, kept staring at the light at the top of the wand to keep it from going out. This time it lasted for more than a minute before it went out. Seeing this, George happily shouted, I succeeded. Fred looked at this situation and became more confident. He also chanted the spell, and the wand emitted a brighter light. This time, it took five or six minutes before it went out. George asked in surprise, why is Fred's brighter and longer than mine? Fred said triumphantly, because I'm more talented than you. Peter shook his head and explained. Professor Flitwick said in his first class that there are three important factors for the success of magic casting, namely, the wand, the spell, and the firm belief. The spell is just a medium, and a powerful wizard doesn't even need to recite it. Spell out the spell, you can successfully cast the magic. The most important of the three factors is firm belief. Magic is idealistic. As long as you firmly believe in yourself, magic can be successfully cast. And just now Fred was more confident than George, so he persisted longer than you. Quote. Hearing Peter's explanation, the two were thoughtful. In the past, they always thought that a spell was a matter of waving a wand, but it turned out to be a mistake. Seeing that both of them understood, Peter felt a little excited about being a teacher for the first time. He stretched out his left hand without a wand, opened his palm, and closed his eyes. After a while, a ball of light suddenly appeared in the empty palm, emitting a soft glow, of light. He opened his eyes, looked at the ball of light floating in his hand, and smiled. It was his first attempt, and he came up with the idea while explaining it to the Weasley brothers. The magic of this world is very idealistic, and the successful casting of the patron saint spell requires the recall of happy memories. When casting the death curse, it takes a strong will to kill, the Crucitus requires a vicious thought that wants to torture others. So part of the reason why black magic is banned in the magic world is that if you use black magic regularly, people's mind will be in a negative mood, and eventually they will fall into darkness. When he was explaining, he thought about whether magic was idealistic, so whether he could abandon the wand and incantation, directly mobilize the magic power with his mind, and then firmly believe that he could succeed. Unexpectedly, his test was really successful. Although wandless magic is not as powerful as using a wand, it is the most life-saving skill. In today's magical world, almost all wizards are no different from muggles as long as they don't have wands. But if Peter can master the wandless summoning charm, then with just one thought, he can turn defeat into victory. Rather than holding back, the twins' doubts from the beginning were instantly stunned, as if they had seen a miracle. The two of them trembled, the corners of their mouths twitched, and they said in unbelievable unison, you actually know magic without a staff and without a sound. Merlin, I'm dreaming. Peter watched the light in his hand go out, and said excitedly, this is my first attempt, and I didn't expect it to succeed. Fred shouted dumbfoundedly, Merlin, hurry up and kill this monster. This is too shocking, it's also 11 years old, 
why is the gap so big? George asked excitedly. How did you succeed, Peter? Tell us, maybe we can succeed too. Peter didn't hide his secrets, he directly explained all his feelings in detail and let them try. As a result, the two of them blushed as if they were having diarrhea, and they didn't move at all. PFF'd. George just choked out a fart. Peter directly disliked him and stayed away from him, and said speechlessly, are you doing magic or farting? George smiled shyly, I couldn't hold back, hee <laughs> hee. In the end, the two gave up, agreeing that only a freak can successfully display this ability, which led Peter to chase the two to fight in the secret passage. It didn't take long for them to come to the end of the secret passage. Here are the steps going up, with a trapdoor covering the top. The three walked up and opened the trapdoor to the cellar. Go down the cellar steps and enter the Honey Duke shop. The shopkeeper from, who heard the movement, looked up and saw the three Peters, and instantly showed a warm smile, Mr. York, it's been a long time. Are you running out of candy? I'll get you what you need. Peter waved his hand and said, let's go shopping on the street first, and then buy it when we come back. When Frome heard this, he saw the twins behind him, and said with a smile, you are bringing your friends here to play, so I wish you a good time. Peter thanked him, then dragged the twins out of the Honeyduke store and onto the street. George looked at the candy shop behind him and said enviously, I didn't expect the shop owner to be very enthusiastic about you, and he even told you this secret way. Peter shook his head and said calmly, he's just passionate about my Kim Galleon. Come on, let's shop around first. Asterisk. Afterwards, the three of them wandered around, especially when they came to the Joko Magic Joke Shop. The Weasley twins couldn't move their feet at all. They directly bought a few big dung balls with the dozens of copper nut they earned at noon, and then Yee reluctant to leave, Peter wanted to buy them some joke toys, but the brothers firmly refused. Eventually the three came to three broomsticks, and this time Peter asked the brothers and a glass of butterbeer, and they didn't say no. The bar was extremely crowded and noisy, hot and smoky, surrounded by adult wizards, when he saw the three of Peter, he joked, oh, Three naughty ghosts, it's Friday, I remember Hogwarts still why are you here in class? Fred said with a smile, we didn't have classes in the afternoon, and we just happened to be fine, so we came here for a stroll. We have never been to Hogsmeade. The adult wizard looked at the clever twins with amusement, and sneered, little brat, we also graduated from Hogwarts, this class schedule hasn't changed for decades, you can't lie to us. Which secret way did you run from? Come out that's all we have left to play. Then he focused his attention on Peter again, looked at it in amazement, and then noticed the difference in the school uniforms on the three of them, and said in surprise, when did Slytherin and Gryffindor get along so well? They even came out together. George rolled his eyes and asked, uncle, which college did you graduate from? How many years have you graduated? The middle-aged man recalled, I graduated from Hufflepuff, and it has been more than 10 years. Now that I think about it, I think it was the happiest time. Little guys, take advantage of the time, have fun, and graduate later. If you don't, you won't be so happy. Watching the twins and the wizard chat happily, Peter took the initiative to buy a drink. He came to the bar and saw the charming bar owner, Ms. Rosemurda, who was flirting with a wizard, and waited for a while. But seeing the wizard still talking about his deeds incessantly, he didn't mean to stop at all. He got impatient and interjected directly, Hello, I need three butterbeers. Rosmoda looked down and saw Peter, and was instantly amazed by this handsome face, and asked with a smile, Oh, what a handsome little boy, if I hadn't confirmed that you were a boy, I would have thought that there was a charm baby in the store. Do you want butterbeer? Peter nodded, Yes, Ms. Rosemurda, three glasses. Wait a minute, handsome boy. Ms. Rosemurda smiled and touched Peter's face, then took out three cups and walked into the house behind her. The wizard was talking about the excitement when he was suddenly interrupted. He looked at the little boy in front of him with some displeasure. After seeing the Slytherin logo on him, his face showed disgust and said in a low voice, Slytherin's little poisonous snake, today is not the weekend, how did you come here? Peter looked at the wizard's attitude towards him, and said indifferently, Sir, this doesn't seem to be your concern, you are not a professor at the school. The wizard was stunned for a moment. He didn't expect that this Slytherin kid would dare to choke people. He suddenly burst into anger, took out his wand, shook it threateningly, and said, Little poisonous snake, 
you may be used to being intimidating at home, but one thing to remember, don't provoke an adult wizard when you're out there. Your tricks to trick others are not enough to tickle an adult wizard. Remember. Peter looked indifferently at the emotional wizard who was full of drunkenness in front of him, and said, Sir, you are drunk. Also, don't spill the anger you got from other Slytherins on me before. The wizard was provoked by this sentence, pointed his wand directly at Peter, and roared hysterically, You Slytherins are all the same bad bastards, look down on others, and throw them into the toilet if they don't look good. After graduation, just join the Death Eaters and love to torture people. Slytherin people should be wasted. Peter looked blankly at the wizard in front of him, this person obviously had bad memories, and he was still targeted by the Slytherin people. But he shouldn't take his anger out on himself after drinking. He directly took out his wand, surrounded by a super strong armor body, facing an adult wizard, even a drunk wizard, he would not dare to care. Everyone else in the bar noticed this scene, their eyes widened and they didn't react. Finn, what the hell are you doing? Stop it, do you want to enter Azkaban? Ms. Rosemurda saw such a thrilling scene as soon as she came out, an adult wizard actually pointed his wand at an 11 two-year-old child. She yelled at the wizard in shock and anger. The wizard was awakened by Ms. Rosemurda's roar, and when he heard Azkaban, his drunkenness dissipated a little. Seeing what he was doing now, he was instantly in a cold sweat. The wizards do not spare no effort to protect the little wizards and he actually wanted to curse a child. He hurriedly put away his wand. Ms. Rosemurda waved her wand and put the butterbeer aside. She nervously approached Peter and asked concernedly through the magic barrier, Son, are you okay? On the other side, George Fred, who had just had a good chat with the adult wizards, also ran up to Peter in panic and asked, Peter, how are you? Did he cast a spell on you? Peter waved his wand and said, Stop the spell, and pulled the magic barrier down then smiled at them and said, don't worry, he hasn't had time to use the spell. I'm fine. At this moment, the wizard was at a loss, standing aside with a face full of panic. After the twins confirmed that Peter was okay, they rolled up their sleeves and turned to the wizard angrily and shouted, why are you treating our friend like this? You cowards, you want to deal with a child. You should be locked up in Asga. Class. Peter quickly grabbed a pair of twins who wanted to duel with the wizard, and these two guys were not afraid to anger the adult wizard. The drunken wizard was a little sober at this time. Seeing the twins standing beside Peter, he asked in surprise, You are Gryffindor. Why are you with a Slytherin? Fred choked. Can you manage it? You have to apologize to my friend. Otherwise, today's business is not over. My father works at the Ministry of Magic. Get locked up in Azkaban. The prestige of the Ministry of Magic terrified the wizard. He looked at the sight around him and the child in front of him, his face flushed and he apologized to Peter in a low voice, I'm sorry, I'm drunk and my brain is not sober. I hope you can forgive me. Peter looked at the wizard in front of him coldly and said, You don't need to apologize to me so reluctantly, as long as you don't appear in front of us. Peter didn't want to make things worse, or else the school would know about them sneaking out of the school. And Hogwarts has a set of unspoken rules, that is, if you don't get caught, you'll be fine, but if you get caught, wait for at least one semester of confinement. Ms. Rosemurda didn't smile like Yan Yan when she flirted just now. She pointed at the door angrily and said to the wizard, Finn, please leave my bar. Fine had a hard time accepting her indifference to himself, Ms. Rosemurda, you. The proprietress said with a disappointed expression. I know you and some people in Slytherin don't deal with it, but you shouldn't take your anger out on a child. I'm really glad you haven't done anything more serious, otherwise you'll be in Afghanistan in the future. Skaban is here, now please leave my bar. The wizard named Finn left the three broomsticks bar in a daze. It's just that he didn't notice that when he was leaving, Peter's wand silently cast a spell on him. This scene was seen by the Weasley twins and Ms. Rosemurda, who were closest to Peter, but the three did not remind Finn, who was leaving. When things calmed down, the tavern became lively again. Those wizards with vision recognized the super armor protection spell that Peter had just cast, and they were very shocked to announce this to other wizards, knowing that they all only knew armor and protection. This one one two-year-old child can actually cast an upgraded version of a high-level magic spell. This is so rare. The Weasley twins asked Peter with interest, what magic did you cast on that person just now? 
Ms. Rosemurda also looked at him with a smile. Peter said innocently, It's just a little trick, it's just to make him spit slugs non-stop these days, after all, he almost attacked me, I have to give him some color. The slug spell. The twins reacted immediately when they heard it, then showed a relieved smile, and extended their thumbs to Peter, it's really yours. That's an unsolvable spell. It will only stop when the spit is finished. Enough for him. Peter smiled. The slug spell he used was an improved prank spell from Professor Flitwick's notebook, and the effect was much stronger. Enough for the cursed person to suffer for days. As for why Professor Flitwick improved this spell, obviously from the few words in his notebook, it can be guessed that Flitwick was also made difficult by many students when he was a student. And the talented man is obviously not a vegetarian, and he directly used the improved prank spell to teach those who bullied him. Ms. Rosemurda looked at the extremely handsome little boy in front of her, and asked in surprise, Little handsome boy, are you from that pure blood family? At such a young age, you have super strong armor and body protection. It's amazing. The twins said triumphantly, Ms. Rosemurda, Peter wasn't born pure blood, he's from the muggle world. Rosemurda looked at Peter in surprise. She didn't expect such a powerful boy to be muggle-born. You must know that muggle students have never been exposed to magic before entering Hogwarts. And this little boy can now have a high-level magic spell that even she can't. It's amazing. She became more enthusiastic in an instant, and put the three drinks on the tray in front of the three, this is the butter beer you ordered, and I invite you to drink it for free today. It's my apology for what happened just now, and let you be in my midst, terrified in the bar. The three pushed and refused several times to no avail. Under the insistence of the proprietress, they accepted her kindness and thanked her, thank you, Ms. Rosemurda. Thanks to the proprietress, the three of them came to an empty seat and sat down with their big glasses of butter beer. It was a thrill just now, that guy almost cast a spell on you, Peter. Fred exclaimed with lingering fears. Yes, if it wasn't for you to stop Peter, I really want to punch him in the face. Just because you are a student of Slytherin, he is inexplicably looking for trouble with you, and he will go to those adults if he can. What a cowardice silly rats, George said angrily. Okay, don't forget that we are sneaking out of the school now. If there is a big problem, the professors will definitely know about it, and the deduction of points will be a trivial matter at that time, and I am afraid that it will be closed. Even notify the parents, you don't want to get yelling letters, Peter reminded. As soon as the two heard it, they immediately died down and slowly tasted the butter beer. Butter beer sounds like a type of beer, but it's actually a drink, and it doesn't have much alcohol, which is why Ms. Rosemurda is willing to let her three children drink it. It tasted like butterscotch that wasn't that greasy, which was great for someone like Peter who was addicted to sugar. When he decided to leave, he bought some to bring to school to try. George drank the butter beer and made up his mind and said, this beer tastes good. I think we can buy this drink for the students who can't come out of the school, and the sales should be good. Fred added, there is also Joko Widodo's magic joke shop, and the prank props in it should also be liked by many people. At that time, we can write a shopping list for students who want to buy things in advance, and then we will buy it back in one go. Peter suggested to the two brothers, if there are a lot of people buying, you can ask the owner for a cheaper price, I believe they will agree. Then you can earn the difference in price, plus the errand fee, you should be able to make a lot of money. When the two heard it, they were immediately excited, and they could not wait to implement their big money-making plan immediately at this moment. After drinking the butter beer, Peter accidentally clicked into the system panel, only to find that his system points suddenly became 95 points. Only five points away from the perfect score. System, when did my points become so many? Peter asked in surprise. The system replied. The host explores and finds a room that responds to requests, and gets close contact with the main line items, and rewards 10 points. The host uses magic to defeat an adult wizard, and rewards 10 points. Is this also possible? Peter was dumbfounded. Getting up close and personal with main line items. Shouldn't it be the crown? But the problem is that the room they opened on request is not the room to hide things. Is this a close encounter? And defeating grown-up wizards. He just used a slug spell to prank the wizard quietly, and he didn't have a hard face. Is this a defeat? Peter has some brain circuits that cannot be understood systematically. However, 
Peter is very happy to be able to get the points reward. He is only 5 points away from now, and he can exchange for a chance to merge blood. 5 points are easy to get together, and now he has to think about which magical animal to choose. And how to get in touch with these amazing animals. Like an invisible beast that can be invisible and predict the future. An onhinga big enough to fill the entire Hogwarts Great Hall and small enough to fit in a teapot. And the civet cat that split into countless clones after being attacked. A Zulu beast that can travel thousands of miles a day. As well as the phoenix's close relative, the thunderbird that can control the weather and thunder and lightning, etc., are Peter's very coveted abilities. And the basilisk sleeping in the secret room, those eyes that will die if you look directly, and petrified if you look at them, Peter wants to have them too. Maybe there is a snake language ability attached. If these abilities are integrated, Peter believes that he can walk sideways in the magic world in the future. Peter, why are you so happy? Did you think of something funny? The twins asked curiously when they saw Peter's sudden smile. Peter came back to his senses and responded casually, I just thought that tomorrow will be the first Quidditch match, and I'm looking forward to it. The twins believed it, and then said excitedly, the first game is the match between Gryffindor and Slytherin. Charlie and the others have been practicing hard during this time. I believe that the winner will be our Gryffindor. Peter disagreed and said, it's not just you who are practicing during this time, our Slytherin team is also very hard, whoever loses and who wins. It is about the honor of the academy, but Peter firmly stands in his own academy, square. Then take a good look at the results of tomorrow's game. The loser must agree to a request from the winning side. The twins bet unconvinced. Peter shook his head and rolled his eyes, you guys owed me a bet before, and now you're betting again, I think you're going to have a big somersault on this sooner or later. He remembered that these two guys were in the future of Quidditch in the odd World Cup, their hard-earned funds were deceived by Ludo Bagman and nothing left. The twins said indifferently, you didn't ask us again. Maybe we win this time, and we can cancel the previous bet. Peter didn't care about these two guys, and he wasn't going to actually ask them. If he likes to gamble with people so much, he has to make them suffer a big loss to keep his memory long. After walking around Hogsmeade, the three decided to go back. Among them, the twins also got a product leaflet from the Joko Magic Joke Shop and the Honey Duke Shop. They were going to take it back to determine the number of people who bought it. When the two bosses heard it, they immediately became enthusiastic about the twins. The school will only allow students from year 3 and up to Hogsmeade on weekends. If there are twins to be promoted at school, their sales are bound to increase. Therefore, they have expressed that if they buy a large amount, they are willing to sell them to the twins at 90% of the original price. The Weasley twins are very happy about this. The price of these candies and joke props is not cheap. The average price is about one silver west. And if it is 10% cheaper, you can earn at least two copper nat for every item sold, one silver west can be equal to 29 copper nat. If they can sell 500 items, they can earn one galleon. That's a lot of money for the twins. The twins' business, Peter was not involved in it, he held a small barrel of butterbeer with a shrinking spell in his hand, and after buying a large package of snacks from the candy store, he followed the excited Weasley brothers. He hurried to the school through the deep secret passage. Coming out of the secret passage behind the hunchbacked one-eyed witch statue on the third floor, the three happily walked downstairs, only to bump into the serious-faced Professor McGonagall. Seeing Professor McGonagall's unhappy expression, the three suddenly felt bad, and Peter quickly hid the candy and butterbeer in his hand behind him. Mr. York, I saw it all, you don't have to hide things. Professor McGonagall looked at Peter's hands which were obviously not from the school, his expression became more serious, but still said, I'm here to find two Weasleys today, you can leave first. Okay, goodbye Professor McGonagall. Peter sighed in relief and walked away quickly, ignoring the sad expressions on the Weasley twins behind him. Before he could go far, he saw Professor McGonagall directly lift one ear of the two of them, and roared angrily, how dare you sell your own potions to your classmates. You even encouraged them to cheat in potions class. Professor Snape told me, in the potions class in the afternoon, he discovered that many students secretly changed their own potions when they were testing potions. They were drinking alternate potions of unknown origin. He was very angry about it, because many students said you sold them the potion. This is a very serious matter. 
What if a student drinks your potion and has an accident? You will be locked up for a month. The confinement of. Peter laughed as he listened to McGonagall's anger behind him and the twins pleading for mercy. He had expected this for a long time. In addition to being a master of potions, Snape also had attainments in legilimency. These pure and simple students, even if Snape did not need legilimency, could easily see them. There is a ghost in my heart. Asterisk. Back from Hogsmeade, the school afternoon had just ended, and dinner was a long way off. After returning the snacks he bought to the dormitory, Peter did not go to the library to read books, but walked along the Quidditch pitch to the Forbidden Forest. Looking at the deep Forbidden Forest, Peter guessed if there were magical animals of his choice in it. Alas, students are not allowed to enter the Forbidden Forest. Which academy are you a student? Why are you here? A loud voice came from outside a hut in the distance. Peter turned to look, and saw a giant nearly two or three meters tall, walking towards him. The rough face, the beard, and the fierceness all over his body made Peter know that this person was a good person. Couldn't help but take a few steps back. Hagrid walked in and found out that he was a Slytherin student. He couldn't help frowning and asked cautiously, what are you doing here? Do you want to go to the Forbidden Forest? Peter pretended to be innocent and explained, I just came here by walking. I know the Forbidden Forest is very dangerous, so I won't put myself in danger. So don't worry sir, I won't rush in, of. Then he asked curiously, Sir, are you a professor in the school? I remember that you were the one who picked us up into the castle when we entered the school. It was the first time that Hagrid saw a Slytherin student who was so polite to him. He coughed a little uncomfortably, the resistance on his face a little lessened, he shook his head and said, My name is Hagrid, I'm not a professor, I'm from the school. Key keeper and forbidden forest keeper. Peter pretended to be surprised and admired and said, Mr. Hagrid, you are amazing. I heard that there are many dark creatures in the Forbidden Forest, but you are actually responsible for guarding the Forbidden Forest. I heard that there are werewolves in it, Mr. Hagrid, have you seen them? Will they not are you going to come here? Being stared at by a Slytherin student with adoring eyes, Hagrid was very useful, but at the same time a little uncomfortable, and said, just call me Hagrid. There are indeed werewolves in the Forbidden Forest, but they all live in the depths of the Forbidden Forest. I will come here, there are eight eyes here, ahem, so I can't get into Hogwarts, don't worry. Immediately, he made an expulsion and said, come on, don't stay here. Although it is only the edge of the Forbidden Forest, it is still very dangerous for you little wizards. As Hagrid kept pushing and shoving Peter, Peter asked, eight-eyed what? Hagrid, do you mean there are other dangerous animals in the Forbidden Forest? Hagrid was a little impatient with this curious little wizard, and he only said, this is not your concern, go back, or I will tell your dean. Peter still didn't give up and asked, I heard that Professor Cadleborn, who is an elective in the third grade, the protection of magical animals, lives in the Forbidden Forest. Hagrid, do you know how to contact him, I like magical animals very much, wanted to take this course in third grade so wanted to ask him some questions. Hagrid, can you help me? When he heard that Peter likes magical animals, Hagrid's attitude softened a little. As a fan of magical animals, he is close to Professor Cadleborn in the protection of magical animals class, and Cadleborn strongly recommends Hagrid as his successor in the future. Hagrid looked at the Slytherin first-year student in front of him, and asked suspiciously, you really think so, not for anything else? Peter tried his best to be sincere, nodded to Hagrid, and threw a bang, saying, I have a phoenix, and I want to discuss with the professor how to take care of it. Saying that, he summoned Field directly. With a puff, a flame flashed from the sky, and a gorgeous phoenix flew out, making a pleasing sound, and then landed on Peter's shoulder. Hagrid looked at this scene with surprise, especially the very beautiful phoenix, Merlin's beard. I thought only Dumbledore had a phoenix in the wizarding world, but I didn't expect anyone to tame it, and it was an eleven-year-old child. Peter explained, I didn't tame this. My dad is a wildlife conservation expert. He found Field, who was still an egg at the time, in the virgin forest of South America and sent it to me. By the way, Field was my gift. It's named after it. Hagrid asked inexplicably, specialist in wildlife conservation. Does this profession exist in the magic world? Seeing his puzzled expression, Peter understood that he regarded himself as a pure-blood wizard, and explained, 
I'm a muggle-born wizard, and as a wildlife conservation expert, it's similar to what Newt's commander does to protect magical animals. It's just that one is in the muggle world, and the other is in the wizarding world. Hagrid looked at the boy in front of him in surprise, are you muggle-born? Doesn't Slytherin only recruit pure blood and half-blood wizards? Peter shrugged, I'm the only muggle student to be sorted into Slytherin in nearly a hundred years, and I'm surprised too. After hearing that Peter was a muggle-born, Hagrid was no longer wary of him, but said comfortingly, that sorting hat is crazy, it has been used for another thousand years, and I think it is because of a broken brain to put you in there. Slytherin is very unfriendly to muggle-born students. You're not being bullied by them, are you? Peter was amused by the sudden concern of the three-meter man, apparently Slytherin's notoriety was already well-known and deeply ingrained. He didn't turn down Hagrid's offer, and he came here to befriend him. In the future, if he wants to integrate the blood of magical animals, he has to find the source of magical animals. And Hagrid, who is a fan of magical animals and guards of the Forbidden Forest, is a very suitable candidate. There are a lot of magical animals living in the Forbidden Forest. Befriending Hagrid allows him to get in touch with these animals at the first time without having to search for fusion objects. Peter shook his head and said, I beat everyone else in the Slytherin chief scramble, so none of them dared to mess with me. Nice job, you should teach them a good lesson, these people are so bad, many of their parents are under the Dark Lord, and they quibble that they were cursed to do so and escaped punishment. Hagrid said a little excitedly, then reacted, and said to Peter a little embarrassedly, of course I'm talking about the lackeys of the Dark Lord. Muggle children like you are definitely different. Asterisk. Afterwards, Hagrid widened his eyes and stared at the phoenix on Peter's shoulder in fascination, and murmured, the phoenix is really a magical creature, beautiful and powerful, capable of fighting dragons. He stretched out his huge palm, as if he wanted to touch but didn't dare, and asked nervously, can I touch him? That phoenix in Dumbledore is very grumpy and always ignores me. Peter nodded with a smile, and then motioned Field to fly to Hagrid. In order to achieve his goal, it was understandable that Field would be taken advantage of. So Field reluctantly flew over to Hagrid's shoulders, combing his feathers. Hagrid didn't expect such good benefits, and was immediately flattered. He carefully touched the phoenix's feathers, looked at Field's long tail feathers, and said in surprise, Field is a boy. No wonder it's so beautiful. Peter was a little surprised. He was able to communicate with Field before he knew his gender. He didn't expect Hagrid to recognize his gender so quickly, Hagrid, how did you know Field's gender? Hagrid said confidently, Phoenixes are birds, and birds are generally more beautiful than males. Dumbledore's phoenix fox is a female phoenix, she is not as good-looking as Field. Field could understand people's words, and when he heard Hagrid's praise of his beauty, he raised his head proudly, and he decided to be nice to this half-giant. Peter looked at Field's performance, and it was a little funny. Field was born not long ago, and he was still very young in age. The only time he had Nirvana was because of Peter, so his personality was more like a child, and his mood was fluctuating. While Hagrid was admiring Field, Peter asked casually, Hagrid, do you know such a magical animal as a bird snake? I have seen their introduction in a book. It is said that the eggshell of a bird snake is sterling silver. And this magical animal is as big as it should be, big enough to fill a large space, and small enough to hide in a small teapot or even a smaller space. Hagrid said confidently that he is familiar with magical animals, of course you know that bird snakes are magical animals living in the Far East. They have the body of a snake and the wings of birds. They eat insects, mice, birds and monkeys. Their eggs are made of the purest, softest silver. So many wizards are playing with it. It's an endangered species now. Then Hagrid said angrily. Not long ago, there was an idiot named Lockhart who actually declared in the newspaper that he hoped to use bird snake eggs to produce a lot of bird snake egg yolk shampoo. He really should use his brain not much bigger than the fairy to think about it. Think, bird snakes are already very rare. He still wants to use such precious bird snake eggs to care for his hair. How stupid. Fortunately that fool's suggestion was taken as a joke, otherwise it would be a pity for these poor little guys. Hagrid said proudly, although the bird snake is now on the verge of extinction in the Far East, many people don't know that in England, these little guys have been saved a lot by Newt's commander, and they are now all with Newt's commander. Live together in Dorset. I went to see it once. 
It's spectacular. Hundreds of bird snakes were gathered by Newt's commander, gathered in a huge space created by magic, and lived freely. Quote. Peter was surprised. Hagrid, I didn't expect you to know Master's commander. I've read most of his book Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, and the content is very exciting. Hagrid raised his chest and said complacently, Of course I know, Newt is very good. He likes magical animals very much like me. He has been running around to save endangered magical animals all year round. He once wanted to give me two of his sniffers. Sniff, it's just that I can't stand these energetic little guys, so I refuse. By the way, do you know Sniff? It is also a kind of magical animal, with a bag that can never be filled, always likes shiny things, and Gringotts trains them to find treasures. Quote. Peter nodded and said, I've seen it in Scamander's books, it looks like a platypus in the muggle world. It looks cute. Hagrid looked around suddenly, and whispered in Peter's ear, In fact, there are bird snakes not only in Newt's place, but also in the school's forbidden forest. There is already a population. I went to see it not long ago. Many bird and snake eggs are about to break their shells. These bird snakes were quietly cultivated by Kelterborn. When he visited Scamander, he asked for a pair of bird snakes, and then developed into the current size. I won't tell him to ordinary people. When Peter heard it, he was immediately pleasantly surprised. He was still thinking about how to catch up with Scamander, but he didn't expect that there were birds and snakes in the Forbidden Forest. He asked excitedly, Hagrid, I wonder if I can follow you to the Forbidden Forest to see the birds and snakes. When Hagrid heard this, he instantly looked at Peter vigilantly, and said, Are you like everyone else, wanting to pay attention? That's not possible. Peter didn't know whether to laugh or cry. His goal was not just some silver. He said speechlessly, Hagrid, you are overthinking. I am a noble in Muggle society, so I don't want to covet some silver. I just want to see this kind of thing. Fantastic beasts. Hagrid thought the same thing, then relaxed, but still shook his head and refused. No, the bird snake lives in the depths of the Forbidden Forest, which is not a place for students to go. And these little guys are raised by Celticborn, I can't take others to see it without his consent. Seeing Hagrid's lack of oil and salt, Peter changed his approach, so, Hagrid, say hello to Professor Keltborn first, and say that if he can take me to see the bird and snake, I'm willing to take field lend him to observe for a day. I think Professor Keltborn should be interested in such a rare species as the phoenix. Hearing this, Hagrid didn't refuse, and said with a certain look, he will definitely agree to your request. At the beginning, Celticborn wanted to borrow Dumbledore's phoenix, but it didn't work. This time I have you. The phoenix, he is afraid that he will agree immediately. Asterisk. After a while of chatting, Hagrid lost his initial resistance, and in order to spend more time with Phoenix, he invited Peter to his cabin. Peter readily agreed. In order to integrate his bloodlines in the future, he would definitely befriend Hagrid, and although this three-meter man was a bit simple in thinking, he was still very reliable. The two came to Hagrid's cabin, which was closer to the edge of the Forbidden Forest than Peter had just been, with a crossbow and a pair of rubber galoshes in front of the door of the cabin. A big black dog was lying at the gate, the saliva from the corner of its mouth kept flowing, and its size was a little scary. As soon as the big dog saw Hagrid, it rushed over with its tail wagging, and then when it saw Peter, it grinned and roared viciously, as if it was about to rush over to bite him at any time. Peter just pulled out his wand to defend himself, he didn't want to be bitten by a dog. Yeah, shut up, go back, Hagrid called to the big dog, and then said to Peter, Ya looks big, but he's very timid, just to scare you, he doesn't dare to talk, don't worry. Peter can't believe Hagrid's definition of not dangerous. In his eyes, the vicious three-headed dog is just cute, and the man-eating eight-eyed giant spider is not dangerous and even wants to raise a dragon. Random Peter walked into Hagrid's cabin, still on guard. There is only one room in the cabin, with turkeys, pheasants and ham hanging from the ceiling, a pot of boiling water in a copper pot in a brazier, and a large bed in the corner with a quilt made of rags. Next to the fire is a clean wooden table and chairs. Hagrid looked at the bright Peter, and said a little embarrassedly, Please sit down, I'm a little messy here, please don't mind. Peter looked around. Although it was a log cabin, it was only relative to Hagrid's size. Peter's small body feels very spacious inside. He directly found a stool to sit on, and then put Field on the table. 
he said to Hagrid sincerely. It's really nice here, Hagrid, how long have you lived here? Seeing that Peter didn't dislike it, Hagrid was very happy. He went to the cupboard at the foot of the bed, opened it and rummaged for a while, then took out a bag of tea, went to the boiling copper pot, and sprinkled the tea into it. Then he said with a smile, I don't remember very clearly how long I lived here, anyway, it's been at least a few decades. Since my father died, when I was young, the merciful Dumbledore looked at me and let me live. Here, as gamekeeper, didn't make me homeless. Peter was familiar with these things, and he also knew that Hagrid was framed as Myrtle's murderer by Tom Riddle, a senior at the time, Voldemort, who was expelled from school and broke his wand. If it weren't for Dumbledore's resistance, he would have been in Azkaban, and Dumbledore knew he was wronged, so he took him in at Hogwarts and repaired his broken wand with the Elder Wand. Although he knew that there were birds and snakes in the Forbidden Forest, Peter still wanted to ask other animals, so that in the future, after the points were full, they could exchange their favorite bloodlines. Peter asked curiously, Hagrid, are there any other magical animals in the Forbidden Forest? Are there any invisible beasts, or thunderbirds or something? Hagrid thought he liked fantastic beasts so he asked, so he laughed and said loudly, if you want to ask where fantastic beasts are, except for Newt's commander and Celt Born, that's all I know. Most. Back then, I also wanted to learn from Scamander to discover magical animals all over the world, so I specifically asked them for advice, and even chatted with those animal smugglers to learn a lot of information about magical animals. Quote. Well, let me think about it. In the case of invisible beasts, there are indeed in the Forbidden Forest, but I have only seen them once by chance. These guys are too shy. They can be invisible and can predict the future, so it is difficult for ordinary people to find them. They, to say that Newt is still the best, he has a family of invisible beasts there. It is said that they have been raising them since the 1920s, and they have been raising them for several generations now. As for Thunderbirds, they are close relatives of Phoenixes. They are also very beautiful. They can summon thunderstorms and sense danger in advance. It's just that these birds are now living in North America. Newt raised one when he was young, and was later brought back to its hometown by him and released. So if you want to see this magical animal, you have to fly to the North American desert to see it. Seeing Peter's disappointed expression, Hagrid thought he thought there were no magical animals in the Forbidden Forest, so he quickly said, although there are no thunderbirds in the Forbidden Forest, there are unicorns, hippogriffs, and thestrals. Fantastic animals and centaur tribes exist, but it's wonderful inside. Then, as if he had reacted, he covered his mouth and muttered, why do I seem to be trying to confuse you into the Forbidden Forest? Seeing this scene, Peter burst out laughing and said jokingly, if I enter the Forbidden Forest in the future, I'll blame you for making it so magical that I can't help it. Hagrid took it seriously, and quickly waved his hand to dissuade him, no, you can't enter the Forbidden Forest by yourself in the future. It's very dangerous, not only are there werewolves, but there are also eight-eyed giant spiders. In short, it's very dangerous. Calm down, please calm down, Hagrid. Peter reassured him, I'm just joking. You know I'm a Slytherin, and I won't put myself in danger until I'm sure. So you don't have to. Worried I'd rush in like a Gryffindor. Asterisk. Hearing this, Hagrid reacted with a groan, and said naively, I just remembered now that you are a Slytherin, Peter, you really don't look like a Slytherin. You have a good heart, and it always makes me forget your identity. Quote. Peter reluctantly said, although it may sound like bragging, maybe I am the real Slytherin. I have always thought that the atmosphere in the academy was ruined by that Voldemort. I have checked a lot. According to the data, although the previous Slytherins were not very gregarious, they were not as unpopular as they are now. I never thought that any college must be a good person, and anyone must be a bad person. Hagrid shuddered when he heard the words, so frightened that the copper pot he just lifted almost lost his grip. With a look of admiration in his horror, he said with a trembling voice, You, dot you actually said the name of the mysterious man just now. Merlin, you are the one who dares to call him by his name except Dumbledore. Don't you know that he cast a spell on this name? Just read his name, and he and his minions can sense it. In the past, many people were caught by the Death Eaters and tortured to death. No one dares to call him by his first name, child, you are so courageous. Peter shrugged and said, 
didn't the Ministry of Magic say he's dead, and his minions are locked up in Azkaban, how can he still come to school to trouble me? You know there's Dumbledore here. Quote. Hagrid said uneasily, but I heard from Dumbledore that the Dark Lord wasn't dead, he just disappeared, and now he might be hiding somewhere, lingering. Waiting for his comeback. Peter fearlessly spread his hands and said, then I will call him by his first name. A person who has already lost once is not worth being too afraid of. When I was in the muggle world, my teacher once told me a famous saying, despise the enemy strategically and value the enemy tactically. Although Voldemort is terrifying, he is also a human being, not a demon. We don't need to fear him so much, and of course we can't despise him. As long as you treat it with a normal heart, there is a solution to everything, but I just didn't think of it for the time being. Quote. Clap clap. There was a burst of applause outside the door, and the two turned around to see that it was Dumbledore and Professor Snape standing outside the door, and it was Dumbledore who was applauding. Principal Dumbledore. Professor Snape. The two looked at the two outside the door in surprise. Of course, Peter was pretending. He noticed someone outside the door early on, so he didn't ask about the magical beasts, but made a big point. Of course, this is also his real thought. Dumbledore walked into the house first and looked at Peter with satisfaction. Peter's words just now fit his heart and he said, Peter, can I call you that? Of course, Professor Dumbledore. Peter nodded. Dumbledore looked delighted, and he sighed, you said it very well. I've tried to get everyone to put their fears aside, the brave side of the dilemma, but none of them adults can compare to a child. The fear is passed on to the next generation. Voldemort is not a god, he is just a wizard who has gone astray, and as long as we are united, there will be no difficulties. Then Dumbledore turned his head and shouted at Snape outside the door, Severus, come in, we're here just in time, Hagrid's black tea is ready. Just in time for a drink. Snape walked in after hearing the words. When he saw Peter, his expression was a little complicated. He also heard Peter's words just now, and he could tell from the tone of voice that it was Peter's true thoughts. That's why his mood was a little fluctuating. He didn't know whether to ridicule the child for his ignorance or to praise his courage. Peter shouted respectfully, Professor Snape. Snape nodded, then stood motionless. Dumbledore waved the elder wand in his hand, two more chairs were added, and then he sat down, like a master, beckoning everyone to sit down, come on, don't stand, Hagrid, sit down too, and also bring your sugar cube, let's have a cup of afternoon tea. The rectangular wooden table, Dumbledore and Snape sat on one side, Hagrid's huge body directly occupied the other side, which made Peter in the main seat feel a thorn under his butt and wanted to move. Four teacups flew from Hagrid's cabinet and landed in front of the four people, and the copper kettle automatically filled the four cups with tea. Hagrid's teacup is in line with his identity as a half-giant. It is said that the teacup is actually about the same as a big bowl. Four cups are just enough to empty the tea in the copper pot. Dumbledore asked the three, how many sugar cubes do you need? Hagrid said as usual, five dollars. Snape looked at the big bowl of tea in front of him, frowned, and said lightly, two pieces will do. After looking at the calculation of the amount of tea, he directly shouted, four dollars is enough, Headmaster Dumbledore. Immediately, the sugar cubes fall into the corresponding teacups according to each person's needs, and rotate by themselves. Then a few people saw with a toothache that Dumbledore put the rest of the dozen or so sugar cubes into his own tea. After a while, the tea has turned into sweet and greasy sugar water. Dumbledore picked up the large teacup that covered his face, took a sip, and narrowed his eyes comfortably. Snape next to him has made an undisguised expression of disgust, constantly complaining about the old bee. How can you not get tired of eating so much sugar? Although Peter already knew that Dumbledore was addicted to sugar, he didn't expect it to be so scary. This is no longer sugar. Looking at Dumbledore's white and complete teeth, he was very curious about how Dumbledore protected his teeth from cavities. Hagrid drank black tea and asked, Headmaster Dumbledore, why did you and Professor Snape suddenly come to my hut? It's so rare. Hagrid was very happy, he hadn't been here for so many people for a long time. Asterisk. Thanks for watching, please like and subscribe.